yeah, delighted to be here and certainly I think a lot of what's been discussed already this morning, sorry, this afternoon, it's still on morning time here, um, has uh, translated really well. What I'm seeing in Australia and in Asia PAC in general is definitely some of the same challenges that we're dealing with here. And um, I've spent 28 years living and working in sales, li living in sales, working in sales um, for mostly US-based software companies. And um, it, you know, when you're working in those sorts of environments, you see a lot of change. I've certainly seen a lot of change in the, the last 28 years, but no more so than we're seeing right now. And we've already touched on that. So this afternoon, I want to talk through a little bit. Do I need to turn this on? Should be on. Should be on. There we go. I want to talk through some of the context, and I know we've touched on some of this already, but I think with the businesses that I've managed and the sales teams that I've run, one of the things that we don't typically do is we don't zoom out and step back. I think salespeople are you know, driven so much by short-term, quarterly, monthly targets, we tend to forget to step back and have a look at what's going on around us. So I want to build on some of the stuff that Martin's talked about and, and some of the other presenters have talked about as well, Phil as well. Um, around context and those external factors that are driving all of us around sales. Then I'd like to just touch briefly on uh, some of the implications um, of the context for all of us in business in general, sales and marketing. Um, and I'll follow that with um, 10 recommendations. I'm, and I've got quite a bit of content to skip through here fairly quickly. I do tend to talk fast, so I'll move at a reasonable pace. But 10 recommendations on what we should all be doing as sales and marketing leaders to prepare for the future that's coming. Um, you'll see out the front, I've got the book that I've written. Um, I've spent the last five years now researching and writing two books and nearly all of, the, all of the opinions and all of the research that I've pulled together have come directly from buyers. So I'm, I'm, I'm one of those sales leaders that, that no longer listens to so-called sales thought leaders. Um, some of you may, see, may have seen a post that I put out a while back where I, I put my own face up and I said, stop listening to sales thought leaders, just go and ask your buyer. That's the greatest source of feedback. In the research phase of the second book, I interviewed a lot of enterprise level buyers in Australia and I asked them, I asked them specifically, what's it like dealing with vendor salespeople? And some of the feedback was pretty confronting. So nearly everything that you'll hear from me today comes from that buyer perspective. So context. No one, no one disputes that we live in the age of the customer. We've already talked about that. When you look right back into the history of sales, and I go into, the, in, into some detail the history of sales right back to 1884, when John H. Patterson first developed some of the sales fundamentals that we are all still using today. So autonomous agents out in the field, um, uh, geographic territories, defined territories, managed to a quota and motivated by commission. Those fundamentals are still being used today, 125 years later. So if you look at all of those changes, I think, Phil, you had some pretty good examples there of all those different types of sales, precision selling, target account selling, solution selling, and so on. Um, not a lot has changed in that period, in my opinion. There's been tweaks and variations, but the fundamentals have remained the same. Now, of course, in the age of the customer, we've moved from vendor push to customer pull. It's all totally, totally different. And we all need to adjust, quite simply. The changing behaviour, if you look at things like, and, and I'll, I'll give you a few stats from various analysts, but CEB has said that 57% of the buying journey is completed before uh, the buyer engages <coughs> with the vendor now. I think everyone would agree with that. Um, this was one that I think you mentioned, Martin. 85% of relationships without the human interaction. Gartner quote. IDC have said that buyers are using social media to research vendors. We all know that. I don't think anyone disputes that. They're all looking at us now online more and more. And 55% of buyers start their online search with Amazon reviews. So independent advocacy, you know, we're all using comparison sites and blogs and forums to get an independent view rather than listening to perhaps a biased vendor salesperson. And of course, we all now, now know that buyers are using consensus decision making. So you're no longer selling to one decision maker anymore, you're selling to groups of people. And there's a, I think it was a stat mentioned before, 53% uh, no decision, yeah. So our biggest competitor these days is no decision. No wonder, when there's 6.8 people involved on average in every decision, how do you get consensus with people that have got different agendas, they're from different business units, they've got different you know, motivations to make a decision. Quite often that's very difficult now. The buying journey, 
Um, as a young rookie sales guy, um, I was always taught just make sure you're up in, you know, in the, in, in the client account in the early stages and make sure that you're you know, pushing the buyer through a process. And it was a sales process. There wasn't a buying journey. Now we're talking about buying journey, aren't we? And this is just a very generic, you know, vanilla buying journey. Uh, rarely is the buying journey a completely linear one. We know that buyers tend to go around and around in circles at times. But generally they'll go through three fairly straightforward stages, awareness, consideration and purchase. And if you look at what Mr. Halligan at, uh, at HubSpot said, people are shopping and learning in different ways now compared to a few years ago. And as marketers and salespeople, we have to change and, and get used to that. To, to use the, the CEB quote, what's now happening is that the, the buyer is doing 57% of their research and their decision making before they speak to the vendor. This, this is, people generally agree with that, that sort of stat. I mean, we all do it in the B2C space, don't we? We all go out and research before we buy anything. We don't just jump in and start calling a vendor, or we certainly don't answer the cold call from the vendor anymore. So when, obviously, when um, the buyer is doing 57% of their research first and you're coming in late, your chances of winning are very, very small because you haven't had a chance to control or influence the buyer. And if you, talk, you know, take another stat from someone like uh, Corporate Visions where 74% of buyers choose the first sales rep to add value. Uh, meaning if you're not in, if you're not getting the buyer's attention back here before they start their buying journey, then what chance do you really have? It's a pretty difficult one, isn't it? And this is the new reality that we're all grappling with. We're all having to try and get attention, find the buyer who just happens to be in the buying you know, the buying state, they've moved out of a status quo state, they're now in a buying state. How do you get their attention? How do you engage and nurture those relationships? How do you open with a narrative that you can carry forward through this journey? And that's the biggest challenge I think we've got. And it's only going to get worse as buyers become more and more educated. I uh, got my first, um, first serious sales role back in 1997 with CompuWare. US-based software company working in Australia. And back in those days, um, I'm sure there's, well, certainly I think you're 37 years, you said, Philip. Um, those of you that have been around as long as I have um, will know that back then I could pick up the phone and I could say to any enterprise level customer in Australia, hi, it's Graham Hawkins from CompuWare. Love to come out and talk to you about your file and data management. And metaphorically, the, the red carpet <coughs> would be rolled out. You know, everyone would say yes. I would get a meeting every time because of information asymmetry. So they didn't know how to solve their own problems. And the vendor did, the vendor held all the cards, and so the meetings were easy. So back here, I would row my boat out into the sea of opportunity, <laughs> and the fish would jump in my boat. It was so easy. Reps back here in 1997 were making their, their numbers just by standing by the fax machine. <laughs> A few nodding heads there, Denise. Yeah. Yes, so you know that's how it used to be when the vendor had all the cards. Of course, along came the internet and the access to information that Martin talked about so eloquently. Managed service provision ushered in the age of cloud and everything as a service. Um, Amazon Web Services was launched, some of you may recall, 2006. And that, that also brought in the, you know, the, the consumption-based models that we're now all seeing. So no longer are, are buyers having to spend huge amounts of money up front on purchasing software. They're doing trials, they're doing POCs, they're buying on a monthly basis, software as a service, right? By the way, I should say, I'm from the software industry primarily, so I do tend to talk in those technology terms. Along comes smartphones that, uh, that you know, Richard talked about, Samsung and big data and analytics, and now here we are in, in 2017, and now I've got this u -butte fantastic GPS-guided sonar boat. I go out into the ocean, there's boats everywhere, and although I've got all this new high-fangled equipment, I can't catch a fish these days. So that's you know, a, a simple way of, I think, illustrating the difference between information asymmetry and information parity. When the buyer has the same information as us, how do you catch the fish? Very difficult. Um, let's just look at the last 10 years between 2007 and 2017. All of this change from here to here Vendor push to customer pull, customer aware, customer led, and so on. Um, I'll let you read those, but the two that jump out for me, again, information parity. And now we've got to focus, thank God, we've got to focus on lifetime customer value 
instead of just, you know, the next sale, close the next sale. Monthly and quarterly shuffle, I call it. So we're now as vendors and marketers and, and business people looking at how do we nurture this relation post the first sale and make sure we're, you know, getting the most value from the, the, the relationship that we can get, customer, lifetime customer value. Um, has anybody read this book, Exponential Organisations? Who's read that one? Nobody? Um, when you write a book, you spend more time reading than you do writing. So I've read just about everything in the last five years. This is a terrific book. It really helps explain something um, that, that sort of jumped out at me, and that is the way these exponential organisations are growing these days. Um, generally speaking, the businesses that we all deal with will grow at a fairly linear rate. Compound, well, perhaps not your business. 70% um, compound annual growth rate's fantastic. But generally speaking, it's, it's steady growth, it's linear. Um, all of the benchmarks in indexes that we look at these days have generally got fairly linear growth. Except these, you know, superstar organisations like Salesforce and like Slack and LinkedIn and all of these, these extremely, you know, explosive growth companies. And what that's doing now is it's creating this almost this, um, this two-speed economy where the mainstream businesses that are growing at, at a fairly linear and slow pace are now really panicking. Um, we've got, you've all heard the term VUCA. Is that a term that you guys are used to over here, VUCA? Volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. It's a military term, it's overused, but we tend to use it in Australia quite a bit. So there's this VUCA happening now. All of these mainstream businesses that we all try to sell to, they're all panicking about disruption. They're worried about, you know, big companies like Amazon coming along and, and, uh, and uh, innovating them out of the business. So case in point, our incumbent telecommunications company in, in Australia is Telstra. Some of you may know Telstra. Huge monopoly, a bit like BT here. They just announced to all shareholders that they would not be paying a dividend this year. And the CEO came out and said, we're doing that because we're stockpiling cash as a war chest because we're worried about disruption. Now, for Australians, that is just, that's unbelievable because this is a big company that makes huge profits, well-established, market leader by a mile, monopoly almost. And here's that business worried about these growth organisations disrupting them. So we do have this, this dynamic happening now. It's a big change. And if you're selling to these larger, you know, sort of mainstream businesses, rapid and disruptive change is something that those businesses really grapple with. So everybody's worried about risk now. That's one of the recommendations I'll talk about shortly. But if you're going to be selling to a mainstream business, not one of these growth businesses, start having a think about the context, this context that they're all grappling with. That is disruption, risk. They're all concerned about making the wrong decision, hence the rise of consensus decision making, etc. So I think that's, that's a great way to um, explain the context that we're all, we're all working in now. Um, because of this growth, and I think Philip, you said it, um, the, the business velocity, or I'm not sure whether it was you, but we're, 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 you know, everything's speeding up, everything's going faster now. So we're hitting market maturity much more quickly. Products, product life cycles are going like that, sales cycles are getting longer because it's more and more complex, but we, we gen we're generally going through this curve much more quickly. Now, most of you will know mature markets are characterised by four things. High levels of commodity, high levels of competition, um, downward pressure on pricing and margin. But the most important thing you've got when you've got a mature market is a sophisticated buyer. And again, to the point about information parity. Mature markets, if we're going through the cycle quicker and quicker now, you've got to be aware that your buyer is probably sophisticated, they've done their research, they know what they want, they're probably loyal to a certain brand. So market maturity is another thing I think that we're, we've got to understand a bit more. I've never had, in my career, I've never had a sales leader say, you know what, we're down here in the in introductory or growth stage, so our, our sales strategy, our go-to-market plan is based on, you know, being in this part of the stage or part of the journey. And, and likewise, if you're in the decline stage. So we are going through these cycles much more quickly now. Um, I think Martin might have talked about the explosion of connectivity as well. Here we are in 2017 with about 28.4 billion devices, connected devices, data being accumulated, structured and unstructured data being accumulated at, at a breakneck speed. And you can see the trend line. In the next three years, we're going to be up around 50 billion devices. 
when you think about the Internet of Things. So our ability to uh, collect data and, and all the disruption and, and innovation <coughs> that's caused on the back of this is the context that we're, we're all trying to sell in. This was the other one that jumped out at me. Typical Fortune 500 organisation would, would generally take about 20 years to hit a market cap of a billion dollars. Now, of course, with this speeding up of the economies that we work in, Snapchat, Oculus Rift, two years. Again, to the point about these exponential organisations. If you, if you just have a look at what all the big vendors are talking about now. So Amazon, um, Mr. Bezos says it's artificial intelligence. And, um, you know, much to Martin's points before about, you know, the rise and rise of art AI. Um, I've got to tell a quick story. I uh, was asked to do a podcast. I think I've told you this one, Alison. I was asked to do a podcast um, a few months ago. A uh, gentleman in, in New York, Noah Goldman, um, and he, he called me and said, listen, you know, I'll, um, I'd love to interview you. Let's do a, um, a chat. I'll get my, my executive assistant to uh, arrange the time for you. So I get, an, I get an email from Amy Ingram. And Amy says, oh, look, you know, Noah tells me that you've, uh, you've agreed to, to do a podcast. How does this time, this time, and this time sound? I said, yeah, that sounds good. Um, we went back and forward about three times, trying to set the date and whatnot. And on the day of the podcast, Noah said to me, so how did you like dealing with my EA? I said, yeah, she was good. He said, you do realise that was an artificial intelligence bot, don't you? I said, yeah, of course I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, that was a bit of a shock. So Amy, Amy Ingram, AI, artificial intelligence. There's a male version as well, I think. Some of you probably heard that one. Um, if you look at what IBM's doing, they're betting the farm on Watson, their cognitive computing platform. That's where that business is going. Um, Likewise, with good old um, Microsoft, they're putting all of their eggs in the AI basket at scale, machine learning. Mark Hurd's not there anymore at Oracle, but you know, they're talking about analytics to, to serve their customers in the moment. You know, again, the speeding up. And um, of course, Einstein at, um, at Salesforce. I was in the um, Salesforce office in Melbourne the other day looking at um, Einstein and what they're doing now with predictive lead scoring. And um, Martin, this might be something that you guys are also doing with, with inside sales. But yeah, some amazing new technology coming to the fore from these guys. So if you, if you consider that context, you consider what all these big vendors are doing, it's pretty clear now that you know, we have to change. We can't keep selling the way we were in 1997. We have to do things differently. So the context, let's talk briefly about implications. Some of this has already been discussed. Um, you know, I've got a slightly different version of the graph, Martin, but effectively the same kind of model. Um, you know, the rise of people failing, um, according to Sales Hacker, it's 63%. I think your Miller Hyman sl stats are slightly better, but let's see a quick show of hands. Salespeople across teams, more than half failing? More than half? Yep. Any, any less than half? Are most people hitting their numbers? Yep, a few here. Um, when I first started managing teams um, in 2005, about two, two out of 10 wouldn't make their number. But now, you know, it's, it's more than 60%. In some cases, it's higher. So, you know, Martin made the point, there is a lot of underperformance going on. Uh, the scary is my CEO's got a new mantra. He wants 70% he wants of our sales guys is hitting their quotas. So we start the year with that target, to your point. Just drop the but quotas? <laughs> I know, that's what I said, but I'm saying that that's, yeah. that's his thinking. Yeah. He start the year thinking, if I get 70% of the sales guys to quota, that's a good year. Yeah. So, like, yeah. It's not a good start point for me, but that's how they... No, no. Yeah, that's a whole can of worms. Um, and we'll maybe talk about that later. Yeah. Um, this is the other one that just defies logic, in my opinion, and that is the, the average sales tenure now. Anyone like a guess at what the average B2B sales tenure is today across all industries? Pretty close, pretty close. 18 months, 16.8 months now, according to, again, Sales Hacker. Um, but what's really scary to me about this, this constant turnover of salespeople is not so much the, the, the total tenure, but it takes, on average, about seven months to onboard and, and ramp someone up to full productivity, which means 10 months of productivity. That's just crazy. And certainly for small businesses, um, my business, Sales Tribe, um, engages mostly at the SM, SMB sort of level, not so much with the high, high end. And 
that is just not sustainable for small businesses, certainly not in Australia. When you're turning people over constantly, one of the, one of the interviews I did with Westpac Bank, um, I interviewed the senior head of vendor management and procurement. And I said, tell me what it's like dealing with, with um, vendor salespeople. He said, oh, don't get me started. He said, it's a revolving door. It's one guy this week, another guy next week. He said, they all look the same, they all sound the same, they all talk the same, they all use the same bloody slides. It's all, you know, very robotic, much like clones. But this is a real problem. And it's a proof point, I think, of, of the implications and the, con and the context that we're talking about. A quick look at the way the, the, the role, the sales role, in my opinion, is, is, is being eroded or diminishing. This is what I did in the old days. I was allocated a territory. I was told, you do all the activities in that territory. Um, you'll get a little bit of support from marketing with some brand awareness and perhaps a few leads, but effectively, you manage the entire process. From prospecting to you know, opportunity identification, solution design, proposal, the whole thing. It was all me, right? That was the traditional role. Of course, now we're moving to this digital era where we've got campaign and lead management, inbound, outbound, all of the te technologies we've just been hearing about um, impacting the role and I think you know, decreasing the, the importance of the sales role to some extent. Not, not in every business, but in most. When you look a little bit further forward, more and more buyers wanting to self-serve, more and more automation, more and more artificial intelligence, then the role of the salesperson becomes even, even smaller in some, in some segments, in some markets, in some industries. So, what does that mean? To me it means, and we've touched on this already with the, with the panel, I was interested in hearing your comments about you know, inside and outside sales, um, that whole thing becoming one almost, the lines being blurred. Um, certainly when you look at where most of the savvy vendors are going now, it's, it's teams of people. I think you said it as well, Richard, the team-based the team -based sale, the one, was it one? One, one team, one, one approach, yeah. I think the future is clearly, you know, a marketing person, sales person, product management person, uh, you know, post-sales customer sex success person, all part of the one team. Because the buyer demands it. The buyer wants a specialist uh, and, and a smooth experience. You can't rely on one person to do all those things anymore. And as McKinsey said, digitally enabled sales models achieve a much better result in the end. Is that, is that ringing true? Is everyone, yeah, most, most heads are nodding. I normally get some disagreement with some of this stuff. Is, feel free to hit me. Say it again. Yes. Yes. Is that important to set knowledge Yep. Yep. Some are still behind, some are way ahead. Yes. And the traditional salesperson is driving the five years. Well, interesting you should say that because you've given me a good segue to the next slide. Um, <laughs> the four selling models, to your point, the four selling models, if you think about it this way, um, every product, I think Martin said it too, every product eventually becomes a commodity. Transactional selling, package solution selling, consultative selling, innovative selling. The higher the investment by the customer and the vendor, the, the higher up that scale you go. The trouble now is that if you're down here in this transactional package solution type sales where your product is a commodity, then you're being viewed, if you're a salesperson, you're being viewed as a generalist. And you're at risk of this guy, whoever he is, the artificial intelligence sales bot, um, taking over parts of, if not all of your role. If buyers in these spaces can quickly self-serve, and there's a business in Australia called Atlassian. Who's heard of Atlassian? Yep. Um, $320 million worth of software sales last year with no salespeople. And a margin that is unbelievable and a growth curve that is incredible. So, you know, generalist salespeople, if you're down here, you're in trouble. Where we need to be, all of us, is moving back up the curve as much as we can to becoming a specialist. Again, buyers demand it. A buyer wants to know they're dealing with someone who can give them commercial insights that they can't find themselves. So being able to deal with a specialist or being a specialist yourself in whatever area, and again, to your point, it is industry specific. Um, some industries are high complex, high value sales. For those of you that are selling products that are down here, you know, there's a lot of change coming for you. This guy is going to potentially need a job. Um, 
Salesforce's report, the future of sales last year, said that only 20% of, of salespeople are currently being viewed as valuable by the buyers. So, you know, what that's suggesting to me is that this number up, or these, these people in this category up here are fairly small. It's only 20%. The exact two stats that Martin read out before, um, Forrester, 24% <laughs> of salespeople redundant by 2020, and 85% uh, of relationships managed without humans. So if, again, to make the point and not to sort of dwell on it too much, it is a bleak kind of message for some people, but if you are a generalist, heed this warning. You've got to start developing specialist skill sets or you're going to be part of this group here. No one wants to be there. <coughs> 